Welcome to Geopolitical Horizons, the podcast from geopolity.com. As we approach the end of 2023, it's a good time to look at what 2024 has in store for us. Here to discuss this is Geopolity founder Adnan Khan. How are we keeping Adnan? I'm good, I'm good Yusuf. Just uh, looking forward to 2024. So let's begin at, at a global level Adnan. What's the current status of the global order and what can we expect in 2024? The context at the moment is pretty straightforward, Yusuf. You've got the US to the global superpower, and there's been question mark over America being at that top spot for a number of years now. Obviously, in the 21st century, the Iraq and the Afghan wars really undermined America's credibility, and the values America stood for, they trampled over. So there's been question marks that can this actually continue? Uh, and really, the, the main challenger to that is China. China obviously has emerged in the last two decades. And that's why one of the main political events in the world currently is the relationship and tension between China and America. And you see this through the tech war, through China's military development, through China's questioning of the global system that America created after World War II. So really, the global balance, if you like, it's really about America. Can it maintain the status quo? And it's about China, who is rising as a power. Can China challenge it and replace America and establish a alternative system, which is based on China's interests and Chinese uh, uh, values? So that's really the current status of the global order. Everything else really is from which I'm sure we're going to discuss. It really fits around that. So, you know, you've got Russia, you've got Europe, and you've got the other events that are going on. But really the key driver of global geopolitics at the moment is this competition between China and America. What are the key issues the US faces in 2024? So I would say free use of really Palestine, you've got Ukraine, and you've got the elections that are coming up. So regarding Palestine, Yusuf, it's going to be three months soon. And what's becoming clear is there are some major differences really between the US and the Israeli government on the future direction of Palestine. So although America has been siding with Israel, it keeps talking about Israel's right to self-defense. What you find behind the scenes and in meetings, America is putting lots of restrictions. America is actually even contradicting Israel. So for example, the Netanyahu said not so long ago that he envisages Israel doing the security of Gaza after the wars ended. And America's talking about holding international summits in the new year to bring in the regional Arab rulers and even the uh, UN. So that clearly shows you there's some major actual differences here. And I think maybe the main issue that we're going to see play out in 2024 on this issue is, for the US user for a long time, the two-state solution in whatever guise was its view of this particular area. That's just not the Israeli view. The Israelis have been very clear they want to take over the whole of Palestine. They want to push the Gazans into the desert. And if you look at the attacks they're undertaking, these attacks are not surgical or for limited objectives. They are causing massive bombardment, which will make the place unhabitable for the people. So that shows you that there are genocidal aims here. And that goes completely against what America wants to achieve. So that's probably going to be a key issue America's going to have to uh, deal with in 2024. Uh, then you've got Ukraine. So February, you step two months down. It will be the three-year anniversary of the Ukraine invasion. And I'm sure we're going to discuss this. The situation in Ukraine now is very different to what it was when we spoke this time last year. This time last year, Russia was not in a great position. Russia started the war badly. There was a lot of support for Ukraine, a lot of investment, a lot of support in terms of mid military and financial aid. Now that's changed. Now in the Congress, there are disputes about contributing to Ukraine's war effort. In fact, a number of reports have emerged now that American officials are telling Zelensky that he needs to begin negotiations with uh, Russia. So that's quite interesting because the situation at the moment is Russia's taken over about 20% of Ukrainian territory and any negotiations, Ukraine will not be in a position of strength. So that's something definitely we're going to be watching uh, next year. And then probably the biggest of all, you've got the US elections. Um, you've got possibly the rerun between Trump and Biden. America is completely polarized politically. And whatever the outcome, there are going to be some serious ramifications to the point, Yusuf, many may not even accept the electoral result in the end. So, you know, unprecedented is an understatement for American elections uh, next year. But yeah, these are the three issues the US is really going to be facing next year. 
it seems like with all these issues, you've got the, the Gaza issue, Ukraine, China. It does really seem like American power is overstretched. Do you think there's space for another power to rise in this? Oh, definitely. Um, if you look historically, Yusuf, and many examples are made of the Roman Empire experience that they were overextended with a lot of wars. The empire had grown. So the defense of the empire took up so much resources that it eventually led to its capitulation. Now, if we look at America, you see, you see for the last two decades, America had been at war. It was involved in wars that went on for way longer than they initially envisaged. It took up a lot of resources. And currently, America's supporting two wars. You've got a war that was ongoing in Ukraine, which is against another peer competitor, Russia. And now you've got this war going on in Palestine, where Israel is involved in a high-intensity battle, where it's getting through a lot of arms and ammunition equipment, so it's going to need to be uh, resupplied. So this is taking up significant American resources. And at the same time, you don't forget, America has to defend Japan, South Korea, Eastern Europe, and Taiwan. So you could say, you said, we're getting to a point where America's obligations are actually beyond its economic and military capabilities. And the worst thing is, if America wished to be challenged by a peer competitor, it won't be in a strong position. If America can't defend Japan, South Korea, Eastern Europe, Taiwan, or Israel, any of these countries, or any of the other American vassal nations or allies, any one example where America can't defend them, it will indicate that America's security guarantees are just not worth it. And that will lead to a massive unravelment. So... American power being overstretched is actually a serious consideration at the moment. And, you know, if I was in Moscow or if I was in Beijing, you know, this would be the top of my agenda if I want to challenge America. If we look at Russia, Adnan, are they a country that could potentially fill this space, especially if they win uh, against Ukraine in 2024? That is the image Russia wants to create. That is the image it's been trying to work to uh, create. And this Ukraine war, Yusuf, one of the reasons that drove Russia to do this is because Russia felt the West were trying to undermine Russian power and effectively integrating Ukraine into the West. So this war in Ukraine and the outcome would determine actually to a large degree should Russia be considered a power or not. And, you know, as we're coming to the free anniversary of the war, Russia is on top now in the war. And Russia, if you remember, Yusuf, it mobilized an additional 300,000 troops last year, which it hasn't thrown into the war yet. So Russia's on top. Ukraine is begging for more arms and ammunition. And they're being told maybe you need to negotiate. And Russia hasn't even thrown 300,000 troops into the war yet. And as we've discussed, the U.S. is overstretched. So I was saying, Yusuf, Russia is in pole position to take advantage uh, if it decides to. It's probably, um, you know, two years ago, Yusuf, when we did our podcast, when the war started, I'm not sure how much you believe, but I, I, I didn't, I thought this scenario they're in today was very far away. Russia started the war so badly, it, it did such a poor job. I was unsure if they could actually recover. I thought minimum, they might need to start negotiating and give some concessions. However, what they've done is they've ground out a victory. They've been on the defensive and they've used what resources they have very, very sensibly and not overstretched. And with the flare up now in Palestine, American Western attention all over there. In fact, now I will say, Yusuf, there's actually a bit of Ukraine fatigue. You know, across Europe, nobody wants to talk about Ukraine anymore. They've had enough. Because when you talk about Ukraine, all you're talking about is more money, more weapons, more war. And people don't want to hear that. And it's election year in 2024. If you're a British politician, if you're an American politician, you know, war and funding for war is not a vote winner. You need to be talking about domestic issues. So actually, Russia is in pole position if it manages as well. And if Russia manages to win this war and negotiate where it keeps 20% of Ukraine, then you need to be engaging with Russia on the on the premise that it is actually a global power that's going to be taken seriously. What challenges does Russia face in 2024 beyond Ukraine? So that's a good question, uh, Yusuf. Um, you know, my previous answer, although Russia is in pole position, there are actually a number of obstacles. So although 2023 generally has been good news for Russia, there's actually some major challenges emerging. And the first of these is the Caucasus. This is an area that Russia has always struggled to maintain. And what happened is, is Armenia and Azerbaijan went to war. Uh, Armenia has always been backed by Russia and Azerbaijan has a range of supporters from Iran and Turkey. And Azerbaijan is, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Azerbaijan became a key supplier of energy to Europe. So you could say Azerbaijan is in the Western camp. And Azerbaijan uh, went to war and completely defeated Armenia. And there's nothing Russia could do because Russia was busy in the Ukraine war. So the Caucasus has always been problematic. 
for Russia. The, the whole Chechen wars in the 1990s been a massive problem for him. And there's nothing Russia could do. Russia's overstretched at the moment. Russia is busy in uh, uh, Ukraine. So this is something the West could turn the screws on and make it even more. I mean, look at it like this. You're in war in Ukraine. And now you've now got another battlefront potentially. That's just not a good place for Russia to be. The other problem, Yusuf, is the International North-South Transport Corridor. This is supposed to be a corridor that goes from Russia through the Caucasus to Iran down to India. It is a North-South trade corridor. Most, if you look, are West-East or East-West corridors. And this is supposed to join the economies of Iran, the Caucasus with India. However, despite the announcement of this corridor over a year ago, it's facing some significant challenges. The first of this is, is the corridor not run by one company or one organization, it's run by different organizations in each of the countries it goes. So the problem is also nobody wants to take Iranian currency as payment. But for, for this corridor to work, Iran needs to take payment in its own currency. The other thing also is um, because of the way oil prices are and because of the tension in the Caucasus, there are some security issues and question marks over stability. So this was going to be like a landmark infrastructure project where Russia was going to show that Russia's back, but now actually is facing significant problems. So these are, I would say, are the two main problems. I mean, you could add a third, Yusuf, which is if the Ukraine war goes on longer, it will start to affect the uh, Russian economy. At the moment, it doesn't seem to be, but with war, it requires a lot of ammunition and things like that. And it's possible in 2024, Yusuf, with most of the key countries in elections, the Ukraine war might be on the back burner, but Russia still has to put troops on the ground. Uh, if Russia plans to do anything major, that will require more resources. So these are probably the three key challenges Russia faces currently. Let's look at China now. China seemed to have had a very quiet 2023. Uh, what's in store for it in 2024? For China, you so probably there's three issues is currently the critical ones. You've got the economy, you've got Taiwan, and then you've got the Chinese premier himself, uh, Xi Jinping. So on the economy, Yusuf, uh, China's facing some significant challenges and you've had a massive real estate bubble that's on the verge of collapse. You've had the largest real estate company in the world in China, it collapsed. And what it fundamentally comes down to, Yusuf, is China's economic model is not viable. China's economy was for a long time based on importing raw commodities and materials, turning them into finished goods and then exporting this to the rest of the world. When the 2008 economic crisis happened, the world, the Western world where it was exporting to all went into recession. So China faced a massive problem there. All the goods it was producing, nobody wants them. So what China did, it did a massive stimulus program during that period to keep the economy afloat. And a lot of money ended up going into real estate, into ghost towns that they made. And they realized that at some point they can't keep this going. However, what they did is as the economic crisis subsided, they just went back to the export model. And the problem now is, is the there's a lot of debt in the Chinese economy. There's a lot of real estate companies that are holding a lot of debt that probably won't get repaid. And then you've got loads of ghost towns that are sitting uh, empty. So this is turning into a bit of a nightmare. And China is struggle to develop an alternative economic model. You'd think with 1.4 billion people, you could make domestic consumption your economic model. But what China's finding is, although we got this image of China's economy developing and it's come a long way, most Chinese are still in poverty or virtual poverty. So they can't consume much. So that's why everything China produces, it goes on ships and it goes to the rest of the world. It doesn't largely go to the Chinese people. So this is going to be something they're going to have to deal with in 2024. In the middle to end of January, Taiwan goes to elections. And really the question here, Yusuf, is, is time running out for China to reunify with Taiwan? So it looks as though the party that's currently in power, who believes in Taiwan independence, they're going to win the elections. And that means that the diplomatic and economic options to reunify are fast becoming irrelevant. And the only option left on the table is the military option. So Xi Jinping has already said that by 2027, he wants to reunify with Taiwan. And the real issue, the problem they're going to have is really the military option is the only one left now. And that raises so many other issues. You know, he brings in America now. China's not been to war since 1979. So this uh, really raises the stakes. And this is something we're definitely going to be following in uh, 2024. And the final is Xi Jinping, Yusuf. Um, I, I would say he's actually half a problem. What has Xi Jinping done for the last 10 years? He's completely centralized China. When Mao passed away in 1976, what his successors did was they created a system which is based on consensus. 
They got rid of this one-man rule, which is what happened under Mao, but it was a massive disaster. And they created a system where there were successions, it was all organized in advance, and you got various political bureaus with a number of people on each committee and each layer. What Xi Jinping has done is completely reversed that and he's made himself like emperor for life. And what's going on is, is he's making a lot of funny decisions but he's not getting the correct information. So you've got economic challenges, You've got the rebel island that's going to election and it's probably moving further uh, away from you. And your only strategy is more centralization. I mean, what Xi Jinping is doing is what the Arab rulers do. Where they feel if they use an iron grip, that's the best way to maintain power. So these are really going to be the key challenge China's going to be facing uh, next year. China was awfully quiet in regards to Ukraine as well. And considering it is allied with, with Russia, it seems a little bit strange. Any thoughts on that? So... The Russian invasion in Ukraine created a bit of a problem for China. On the one hand, you're right, China had this relationship with Russia where they say they want to change the world and they're unhappy with the current global system. On the other hand, China for its economy needs the West. It needs them to keep consuming. It needs to maintain economic relations. So China's vision for the world is Eurasia being crisscrossed with economic and trade corridors and China uses this. Now, that's not the vision uh, Russia has. The vision that Russia has is uh, it has a sphere of control where it has the sole right to control this area. And we're talking here about Eastern Europe, this sort of area. So there's differences. Secondly, China actually criticized Putin when he initially invaded. They said it's not good for the economy. It's not good for the global economy. Then you find China sometimes supported Russia at UN uh, votes. On other times, it abstained. Obviously, the longer this war goes on, it affects the global economy and for China, the global economy is the key thing for it at the moment. It needs to be able to export, and Russia hasn't helped uh, in that. And that's why I'm not surprised they're remaining pretty quiet. Uh, and in fact, you'll find, apart from some talk of China was going to supply some weapons, it doesn't look as though it did in the end. And the, the fact that Russia is having to go to North Korea and Iran for weapons resupply, it shows you that effectively China said to them uh, when they weren't getting involved. How do you see things playing out with US-China relations? especially with the U.S. having their upcoming elections next year? So the current status is, Yusuf, is relationship between China and America are quite tense. Donald Trump started the tariff war. And what Biden done is he's continued and expanded that. Now they've turned into a tech war. There's talk of decoupling. It's really extended. Now that's not going to change. That's going to be the trajectory, really, China-American relations. In fact, I would say Yusuf, Biden's actually been even more aggressive than Trump when it comes to China. So with the elections next year, actually the Biden administration, the Trump administration are quite united on this. They're united on challenging China, confronting China. Both of them view China as a rising power and a peer competitor. The only difference really is, is Trump's talk of, you, you know, having personal relations with heavyweight politicians. So when he was last in power, he used to always talk about other like heavyweight rulers like Putin and like Xi Jinping. He wants to have a personal relationship with them. But what you find beyond that, actually, the policy is actually the same. So I think tensions are going to continue. Competition is going to continue. And actually, a change in the White House in November ain't going to have any impact on this because the trajectory is only going in the same direction. If we look at Europe now, uh, Europe seems to have a lot of problems currently. And how do you see things plan out in 2024? So Europe, Yusuf, when we look at them, it really sees power is ebbing away from uh, Europe. In 2024, you know, Germany, Italy, Holland and France, you're going to see political gridlock. Uh, in Germany, Italy and Holland, you're going to have, co you've got coalition governments. In Holland, they're trying to form a coalition government. And when you've got coalition governments, especially when the position of each coalition is vastly polar opposite, you're going to face some major challenges. So I think it's going to be difficult for Europe. It's going to be difficult for individual countries to have a unified position. And this will really translate into the European Union as well. The European Union goes to election next June, July as well. So that's not going to help. And I, I think we're really seeing now the rise of the right wing. You've seen it in Holland, you've seen it in Hungary, and the likely chances a lot of the right wing will do well in the European uh, Parliament. Even in Germany, Yusuf, the coalition government has done a really, really poor job, and you're seeing the rise of the, the right wing party over there. So Europe's problems are only growing. Europe's influence is also declining around the world. And as we saw in Ukraine, Yusuf, despite Europe being on the border with Ukraine, you find America led the response to Ukraine. It's not actually being the Europeans. You'd think it'd be the Europeans, but they're so divided. They've got so many domestic issues that they can't lead from the front on this issue. So 
2024 doesn't bode well for the European Union and Europe. And if Russia is to win and take 20% territory, it actually means Russia has expanded its territory, which will make life for Europeans even difficult in 2024 and beyond. Uh, yeah, that's one trend that I've noticed, the rise of the far right in Europe. Another trend that I feel is something that we need to look at is it looks like power is slowly shifting from the west towards the east. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, absolutely. So this year, or 2024, the GDP of the East for the first time since the 19th century is scheduled to be larger than the G GDP of the West. And that's quite unique because for the last 500 years, the Europe and the West have been the center of the world. They were colonizing the world. They were the largest GDP. They were the largest exporter. They were the engine of the world. And what you're finding is, Yusuf, the last two decades, we're seeing every metric slowly, slowly shifting away. When it comes to credibility, when it comes to investment, when it comes to financial flows, when it comes to all of these sort of things, you're finding slowly, slowly, the East is taking over from what has been traditionally the, the West's role. So definitely uh, power is shifting. And what this means, Yusuf, is if you look at the global order, it was one developed by the West. If you look at the United Nations, most of the countries are Western countries. And what this means is for countries like China and Russia, is we have a global order that's outdated. We have a global order that was established by nations that lack large economies, and therefore they lack the right, and they don't have the right to be determining the global rules. That's why China and Russia have for a long time been saying, we need new rules, we need a new global system. And the fact that the Eastern GDP will be bigger than the Western GDP is really just going to add to that uh, issue. So I, 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 this is a big problem for Europe, especially, but I, I think Europe really are costing them coming back from this. It'd be interesting to see how America deals with this, because if America wants to reverse this, it needs to get Europe on board. And Europe has got so many problems. But I, I think, Yusuf, whatever happens, I think the trend is clear. You know, power really is shifting from west to east. Uh, we've done a podcast recently on uh, 2024 being the year of the elections. I recommend listeners check out that podcast. But just quickly, there's 75 elections taking place. So that will involve half the world's population. What are the key nations we should be watching? So yes, 75, 76 elections, so there's a lot of elections. Uh, I think overall, Yusuf, what you've got here is whatever the outcome of these elections are, these are governments that are remaining in power for the remainder of this decade. So really, the relationships in the world and what happens in the 2030s are going to be determined next year. The policies that the new governments will put in will determine how relationship will be in the 2030s. And that's what makes these important. So we've obviously discussed the, the US election. We've discussed it in the other podcasts as well. Uh, I think the challenge of the US one, is, it depends all on the outcome because whatever the outcome is, that still will have a major impact on America domestically. But I think the important thing is America is polarized. And when you're domestically polarized, it will eventually have an impact on your global work. Can America maintain its bases? Can America be continue funding so much work abroad when there's so much differences internally. And whatever the outcome of the election, that issue will still remain. Because that's where uh, America is at the moment. You've got election in Russia. Now, it's not really an election. Because what you have is a token opposition. And really, the security class, they dominate the political system. Uh, and what they do is they use elections to gain credibility for themselves. Probably the important thing is, is more specific, is Putin looks as though he plans to stick around. He doesn't plan to uh, transition. But obviously, the issue for Russia is the longer the Ukraine war goes on, it could pose a problem for them. As well. I, I don't envision, I mean, most of the opposition is all locked up. Opposition that does uh, present a threat. Even the 12-hour coup attempt by the Wagner leader, looking back now, six months, it had, it had no impact whatsoever. Uh, the other election is the UK election at the end of the year. The Tory party is deeply unpopular. There's a lot of infighting going on amongst themselves. Uh, UK is in a declining position globally. So whoever comes in is going to have to deal with the domestic issues and deal with Britain's decline. And whoever comes in is going to be in power, really, until the end of the decade. So that's going to be quite important. Uh, there are domestic issues in, you know, the, uh, the Ireland, uh, the, the Scottish referendum is still there. It hasn't disappeared. So the even the unity of the British Isles is a question mark going uh, uh, forward. Uh, in May, June, you've got election in India, largest democracy in the world, as they say. It looks as though Modi is going to win the election, the BJP is going to be the third term, which doesn't bode well for minorities. But what's happened, Yusuf, is the Congress party that has been such a symbol of the country, it's just such, such a weak position. It's just so weak. Its leader is weak. And they've uh, entered into like a 26-party coalition, but they stand very little chance of uh, winning. So 
the Hindu nationalism seems to be winning the day. Uh, Modi implemented a digital program as well, which uh, seems to be uh, are working. So I don't see anything changing there, which basically means India will continue to play a role in the region and beyond. And everyone's trying to win India at the moment. The Russians, the Chinese are trying to win it over. The Americans are trying to win it over. So the fact that there is unlikely to be any change means the status quo will probably continue there. Then you say you've got a host of other countries. You've got elections coming up in two weeks' time in Bangladesh. You've got elections coming up in Pakistan. You've got elections in e Well, the Egypt election is done now. I thought initially there might need to be a second round in Egypt, but it looks like CC got 87% of the vote the first time around. With Egypt, Yusuf, although CC has won, I feel he can only lose now. He's run the country into the ground. He's using an iron grip, made up the election result now. And really, I, I think it's just a matter of time before we see the second Arab Spring uh, coming. The economic situation today in Egypt and the Arab world is worse than it was 11 years ago during the Arab Spring. That's definitely something to watch in uh, 2024. In Bangladesh, Yusuf, I've just heard uh, that last week the opposition has decided to boycott the election. So it looks like the Awami League will win. But the last election, there was a lot of uh, news about rigging. They'll probably do that again. And the economic situation is not great at the moment. The garment workers, which is the largest industry of Bangladesh, they're on strike. Bangladesh has taken on uh, debt. And the Awami League seems to want to continue using the Iron Grip to maintain power. So this is probably going to lead to tensions uh, in the country uh, going forward. Uh, at the moment, the opposition is just so weak that they can't even... I mean, the fact that they're boycotting actually makes it easier for the Awami League to take it. The, the problem you've got in Bangladesh, Yusuf, is it's not just a matter of political parties. It's actually... There's a systemic problem. Uh, what the Awami League have done is they've institutionalized their role. They're trying to become like the Communist Party where they are the state, they're the system. And that just goes against the sentiments of the people. So there's a much deeper issue. That's definitely something we're going to be watching uh, next year. Uh, Pakistan goes to election. Imran Khan just did an AI video uh, in the country. But it seems, Yusuf, Pakistan things are set. The army has brought Nawaz Sharif back. Nawaz Sharif shockingly will get a fourth term. And we'll be watching if he will finish his fourth term because he's never finished a term. However, I think, Yusuf, it's probably the worst time to become a leader in Pakistan but the economy is so bad. Whoever becomes the leader, really it's unlikely they're going to finish their term. The economic situation is so bad that it's all going to get lumped on them. Effectively, the economy has been handed over to the IMF. The IMF wants subsidies removed. It wants Pakistan's currency to be reduced. And this is really hurting the uh, people. So there's actually a number, all, many of the countries where the elections taking place in Yusuf, there are a lot of possibilities of uprisings next year or even beyond with all the economic situation. That's something we will definitely be watching. I've got a set of quick fire questions for you. If you can just give succinct answers to these, please. Is the Iranian clerical system crumbling? So I have a question, Yusuf. Uh, this year we saw the death of uh, Masha Amini, the, the young girl by the, uh, they call them the religious police. You've seen demonstrations that haven't uh, subsided. That problem is in parallel to where the economic situation is. The economic situation has been problematic for a while. Obviously, Iran's under sanctions, but for a lot of Iranians, the clerics, they own the economy. They're, they're corrupt. And that's the biggest issue with them. And this takes place, Yusuf, when Ayatollah Khamenei is in his 80s and there's a lot of talk about transition and will the system continue. The clerical system has now been in place since 1979. It clearly, the people don't like it. It doesn't work for them. So the clerics use the iron grip to maintain uh, uh, power. And usually Iran doesn't have good succession, Yusuf. Whenever there's been a succession, what you find is the existing ruler wants to keep his son or his child as the next leader. We had this problem with the Shah and the clerics are doing that as well. So it's definitely something we're going to be watching. But I think yeah, the days are numbered for the Iranian clerical system. Will the BRICS expansion be the final death knell for the global liberal order? So that's what the BRICS members want you to believe. I don't think it is, Yusuf. Uh, I think, and not because the liberal order has got resilience. It's actually because I think the BRICS organization, it needs more teeth. So although Saudi, Egypt, you all these countries are joining it, even before these countries, you find a lot existed on paper, a lot looked great on paper, but actually you find that the organization actually has very little uh, teeth. Now, by these new countries coming in, it does give it more credibility. However, you know, where's your alternative order? Where's your alternative currency? Where's your alternative payment system? Where's your alternative avenue to deal with international issues? So America is going to start gathering nations in January and having summits on the Palestinian issue. Where is Russia? Where is China? with the alternative summits proposing. Where are they visiting Palestine, the Arab world? They're not. And until I don't see that happening, I, I, I think BRICS is just making a lot of noise, which is great. But the death now isn't because of the resilience of the global liberal order. It's because BRICS isn't really there yet 
it's not at the place that the BRICS members are promoting it to be. Will renewable energy replace coal as a main fuel for electricity? So yes, this year, Yusuf, 2024, that is scheduled to happen. And that's quite significant, Yusuf. Coal has been the main fuel for electricity for, I think, over 100 years. It was the resource that kickstarted the Industrial Revolution. Obviously, it's very dirty. It's led to a lot of uh, uh, issues in the atmosphere. However, it's powered the world for such a long time. And what's interesting, Yusuf, is so if you're a coal producer, if you have coal reserves, then you became a very important uh, commodity market. Now, renewable energy, Yusuf, is not a resource. Renewable energy is used utilizing natural elements such as wind, air, water, and using that as energy. And that means anyone who excels in the technology in these areas will become an important global player. And the countries that are advanced in these areas are not the countries that have the coal. So you might see a bit of rebalancing in who dominates this particular commodity. That can have a knock-on effect on who dominates a particular resource. And that could potentially have a knock-on effect on a country's position in the global system. So definitely something we're going to be watching. Do you predict any coups in 2024? So Yusuf, empirically speaking, on average, there are nine coups every year in the world. And the last few years haven't let us down. There have been coups. The success rate is 50-50 at the moment. I, I think there will be coups because there always is coups. But more importantly, the reasons for coups are various reasons. People are unhappy with their rulers. The rulers are corrupt. Armies are unhappy or armies have ambitions. So obviously we've seen in Africa, the Sahel region, there's been lots of coups in Chad, Burkina Faso, Mali, these sort of areas. And I think this will continue. I, I don't think it's going to uh, stop. Interestingly, coups are probably one of the, their regular feature of the global system. There will be competition. Will there be wars? Yes, there will also be coups as always. You know, um, like war is politics through other means, coup is also politics through other means. Will Imran Khan make a comeback this year? Very unlikely, Yusuf. Uh, I think will he ever make a comeback is probably the question uh, we should be asking. At the moment, the status is Yusuf. Uh, he fell out with the army. When the army gave him some orders to implement, he dragged his feet. And so that was the beginning of the end. He eventually got thrown out of government for a vote of no confidence, which is quite unique considering how much support he had. And then he tried to challenge. He felt he had enough street support to challenge the army. He did. And what you found is the army, through their uh, supporters, they've thrown him into prison and he's got like hundreds of cases against him, which bar him for standing for the elections and things like that. Uh, what this shows you, Yusuf, is you can be the best friend of the army at one time. But the army will always take care of themselves. You turn against the army, you uh, challenge the army, they will teach you a lesson. So he's gone from being the messiah that was going to bring the tsunami of change to now he's having to use AI to make uh, messages to his uh, people. He's still very popular, Yusuf. He, people have a lot of sympathy for him. People feel he's been hard done. But I do feel people in Pakistan are being practical now. They need to move forward. The economy is really, really bad. The options really are Noir Sharif, really. Those are really the only options for them. Um, in the long run, he potentially could, Yusuf. Noah Sharif has fallen out with the army in the past. The army's even overthrown him. He, whenever he's been overthrown, he leaves. He goes abroad. And then eventually, when the circumstances change, he positions himself. And because the army has worked with him in the past, they usually bring him back. So Imran Khan could be back. The problem is there's two things that are holding him against this. One is Yusuf. Imran Khan doesn't actually have a political party. He never did. His part of the PTI really was him and his personality. The people that helped him get into power were not his old school party members. There were people from other parties that joined him. So when he got thrown out of government, those people left him and joined the other parties. Uh, some of his like uh, close supporters, they've, uh, some of them were thrown to prison and they've come out and they've completely like resigned from his party. So if Imran Khan comes back, he's actually got no support. He's fallen out with the army and his party is gone to where it was, which is him. So he's going to have to change all that if he wants to come back, which looks like the odds are against him at the moment. So, you know, I doubt he's going to make a comeback, but I think, you know, we, we shouldn't miss the issue here that the, the, the issue here is about Pakistan and the future of Pakistan. Imran Khan was one little dot. The, you know, Imran Khan has gone now, the economy and the situation of Pakistan is worse than when he came in. Uh, and that's going to continue and that's probably what we're going to focus on next year. Is the military in Myanmar about to fall? So that's interesting, Yusuf. Uh, it's been a major development the last couple of weeks. What's happened is the, the military used the iron grip for decades to maintain power. 
they, due to international pressure, they allowed an election. And what ended up happening in the elections is the pro-Western uh, lady, Aung Suu King, she won. And then in 2021, the army did a coup. And Myanmar, Burma, consists of many different ethnic groups who have been oppressed. What's happened is, is over the last few months, some of the ethnic groups have got together and they've actually run over some of the military bases. They've actually taken over some of the areas in the northern areas. And the military's been caught on the back foot. So definitely something we're going to be watching. Um, I think this is the biggest challenge the army's faced for a long time. Will they be overthrown? I think it's too easy to say yet because at the moment, the ethnic groups who are very divided have done very well. They've kept the divisions aside, but they overran areas and bases where there was very thin military presence. As they get to the larger towns, they need to be more organized. They need to work as a fully functional army rather than rebel groups. And then when you work as an army and you have formations, you are easily visible and you can be easily be attacked. So the advantage they've had is they militia groups fighting a large army. If they start fighting like a large army, then they're vulnerable to that as well. So definitely that will be something we're going to be watching as well uh, in 2024. Thank you for your time today, Adnan. We will make public our full forecast in written form on the 1st of January 2024 for you all to consume. Before then, please also look out for our annual report, the Strategic Estimate 2024, which will be published on the 29th of December. We hope to bring you more content and podcasts in the new year. I'm Yusuf. Thank you for listening.